Good morning, everyone. It's good to see so many of you braving the cold weather this morning. There's a warm welcome here for all of you, however, especially those visiting or returning after a break. We're so happy to see new faces as well as familiar ones. We hope you enjoy your time with God's family here in the Lausen and that you join us again soon. And of course, it's good to see the youngsters amongst us. Any young visitors are invited to go across to the hall today with the other youngsters to join in the fun of Sunday school or to check out teen scene. You'll be welcomed with open arms. If you're under three, mum or dad can take you to play in the creche in the small hall and leave you with the lovely creche ladies at any time during the service. Yes, folks, this is the start of another year, another new year, another year for us to get closer to God and hopefully closer to one another. We know that the Lord is with us and will continue to be with us all through 2024. We're here to have some family time, worshipping together. So let's turn to those nearest us and give one another, especially anyone we haven't met before, the warmest of welcomes with a smile and a handshake, maybe a hug, or if you wish, what we all know to be true, God loves you. God loves you. And there's a birthday in the family today. Yes, it's the turn of Lee Brannan on his, on his 17th day to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Having failed to do so last week, I thought we should now take the opportunity to thank all those who ensured our church services throughout the past year. Firstly, those in the background, our marvelous compiler of rosters, Diane, our bus drivers and escorts, the tea ladies, Beatles, Judy teams, Sunday school, teen scene, and crash staff the puppeteers, and our regulars, Pat's floral displays and decorations, Rona, our office staff during the week and visual aid operator on Sundays, hiding here behind the column, Kathleen, our extremely talented organist, another we rarely see face to face as she sits with her back to us, and the praise band, with Robert on drums, Gareth at the keyboard, George on the saxophone, Gordon with his trombone, all persuaded by Maestro Graham to make wonderful noises. <laughs> Some of the time. <laughs> and our techie team operating the cameras and other electronic gadgets, we call him Jonathan. Please join me in thanking all of them for their constant commitment and all their wonderful service. Well done. <laughs> this just leaves one more person, Reverend Carden, who is surely God's gift to us as pastor, teacher, and friend. There's no doubt Carden has been blessed with an an awesome ability to communicate God's word, to explain and to put in context things we may struggle to understand. We thank God for our dedication to work, her teaching skills, and the joy and feeling of well-being she spreads wherever she goes. Thank you, Karen. We love you.
Nearly back to normal this week. We have the Todd's Toddlers Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. Men's Guild Tuesday evening. Alums' Service, Lunch Club, and Men's Prayer Group on Thursday. And Youth Groups and Drop Zone on Friday evening, all at the usual times. Next Sunday's service is again at 11, and I may remind all elders of our important Kirk Session meeting on Wednesday, 10th January at 7.45 p.m., not to be missed. It's a while since I mentioned our latest fundraising venture, our goodest new charity shop in East High Street, which is proving to be well supported and is bringing in much needed funds. The shop is open from 10 to 4 p.m., Monday to Saturday. Volunteers serve in the shop in pairs, generally on three-hour shifts after on-the-job training. All our current volunteers appear to be enjoying this experience, but I'm told that some upcoming holidays and other commitments indicate that the shop may have to reduce its opening hours and days if we can't increase the staff, and we would not want to close the shop anytime. So I'm asking if there are any of you out there able and willing to spare some time to help us. Any offer would be greatly appreciated. If you can, please contact Diane. Her mobile number is in news from the pews. And finally, all of you, and I mean all of you, are invited across to the church hall this morning after the service for a cup of tea or coffee and a chat before you go home. Folks, it really is good to come together to worship the Lord. As our intro to this morning's service, we sing, Majesty, worship his majesty. Please stand to sing.
Happy New Year, and I hope this one is going to be a really, really good one. It's good for us to come on the first Sunday of the year, remembering what we have learned throughout Advent. For this was a child who was born to be king, who was born to reign. Not in the way that an earthly king would reign, but someone who would reign in our world forever. Someone who reigns in our lives. And it's very good at a time when people make all kinds of New Year resolutions, and some of those are to do with weight and exercise and fitness and well-being, it's very good to remember that if we really want that well-being and blessing, there's no better place to start than by allowing the Lord Jesus Christ to reign in our lives, in our church, in our world, that we follow his leadership, that we follow his commands, that we follow his example. And to remind ourselves again, we're going to stand and sing another wonderful song, The Splendor of the King. So let's talk to God just now. Let us pray. God of love and truth, we come to worship you at the opening of a new year. And some of us may feel fear of what the future may bring. Some of us may be full of optimism for good things ahead. And some of us may feel like we need to turn over a new leaf. But however we are feeling, Lord, we approach you in reverence and humility. And we ask for your forgiveness for the past and for your guidance for the future. We are aware that there are times that we have not heard your voice, times that we have not followed your call. There are times when we have judged others harshly for their faith 
or for lack of it. And we were slow to acknowledge when we were wrong. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us in the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Forgive us and set for us your path for the future that we may have a kinder voice to others, a kinder mindset when we think of others, and a kinder voice to ourselves. Thank you, gracious God, that you, your forgiveness is ours, that this new life for a new year is ready for us to take up, and that your voice will guide us on the way. We ask in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. For our youngsters today, and Leah was actually thinking about you, I hope you got birthday presents as well as Christmas presents. There's always a danger when you've got a birthday that's near Christmas that somebody says, I'll give you one big one for both. Uh, no, that's not the deal. That's not the deal. And it's a strange one. Christmas presents are always difficult. No matter what age, and it's difficult for the person that's getting the present because they don't know what to get for you. When you're very young, they think, well, you haven't had time to work out your likes and dislikes yet. Well, you kind of have. You already know to go, mm, if you don't like that food that mum's trying to shovel in. But you don't know. So what tends to happen is when you're very young, people buy things that will be useful to you, maybe clothes or things like that, things that you're not that much interested in. And as you get a wee bit older, folks start to notice what you like. Oh, they like this kind of toy. I'll get that for them. Or they like that kind of toy or whatever. And then you get older and older and it gets harder and harder because people seem to have got a pile of stuff and what do you give to somebody who's already got a pile of stuff? And you know what's worse is when you say to some of these grown-ups, what would you like for Christmas? And they say, anything. <laughs> well, that's a fat lot of help. And you know fine that you've missed the mark when they go, oh, thanks. And they kind of screw the nose up a wee bit. Well, if you told me what you wanted, it might have made life easier. So presents are always a tricky thing. And the wise men, well, they would probably get the blame for giving presents at Christmas because they're the ones that kind of turn up with gifts at that very, very first event that we now call Christmas, the birth of Jesus. But they didn't have the kind of gifts that you would give to a youngster. And we reckon that Jesus was probably anywhere up to about two-year-old by the time they appear on the scene. So their gifts are very, very different. And it's quite easy for us to, to look at the gifts, and sometimes we can over-interpret Scripture, sometimes we don't do it justice, and sometimes we haven't a clue what it's all about, but we can just give it what we call an educated gift. I guess, and they bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But we need to remember that these weren't really the kind of gifts for a baby. These were the kind of gifts that they thought that they were bringing to a palace for a king. From almost like from one country to another. The kind of thing like if we go down to the Tower of London and you see all of these gifts that have been given to the royal family from different countries over the years. These were special gifts. And we often look at these gifts and think they were actually very, very good and appropriate because they were gifts that would probably come in useful as Jesus starts what we would call his ministry, as he starts working and doing what God wants him to do. 
People look at the incense. Incense was something that was burned in a temple to please God. We look at things like the myrrh, which was a kind of a perfumed ointment, often used for putting on when somebody before they got buried. But also, we believe now that they probably had healing properties in um, and things that would help for pain as well. So these kind of ointments that had a lovely, lovely smell. And then there was the gold. Well, anybody can use that. So it's often thought that these gifts were given to help Jesus in the future. Do you know this? I'm not sure that that's what was in their mind when they brought them. They were the kind of gifts that a country would give to another country to celebrate the birth of a king. But the truth is that they were very, very valuable gifts. Even the frankincense and myrrh were very valuable. And they would indeed be incredibly useful for the grown-up Lord Jesus as he did all of the things that God asked him to do and the things that lay ahead of him in the world. God gives us gifts all the time. We hardly even notice. And he gives us gifts preparing us for a life living alongside him. Living in our world, he wants us to prepare, be prepared to live in our world, knowing his presence with the Holy Spirit being beside us, leading us and guiding us. And he gives us all of the gifts that we are going to need to live for him. Whatever those gifts are. I came in this morning and the first thing that I noticed was that all of the beautiful Christmas decorations had been rightly taken down and put away. But what a gift Pat and her team have when they decorate this place and they make it look so beautiful. I need to tell you, my house doesn't look that beautiful when I put the decorations up. That's an absolute gift that they have got. The kind of things that they use as we serve God in our ordinary lives. And often we don't realize that we've got them or we use them for other things. Know this, that God has a plan for each and every one. He has a purpose for each and every one. You are valuable to him. You will be able to give out his message by the way that you live your life, by the things that you say, and by the things that you do. And he will provide you with everything that you need to do that. We just need to remember to let him reign. If he came to be a king, then we need to let him reign, and we need to give him that priority in our lives. So we're going to sing a little song that says, go tell it on the mountains so that everybody understands that this new king came for all of us.
school on today. If any of our youngsters want to slip on through and have some fun, and we'll catch up with you later, you can tell us all about it. Missing you already. And meanwhile, we're going to turn to God's Word and we're going to have a look at a very, very familiar passage from Matthew's Gospel. And Linda is going to read it to us today. Thank you, Linda. Our reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. Visitors from the East. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the time when Herod was king. Soon afterwards, some men who studied the stars came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, where is the baby born to be king of the Jews? We saw his star when it came up in the east and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard about this, he was very upset and so was everyone else in Jerusalem. He called together all the chief priests and the teachers of the law and asked them, where will the Messiah be born? In the town of Bethlehem in Judea, they answered, for this is what the prophet wrote. Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, you are by no means the least of the leading cities of Judah, for from you will come a leader who will guide my people Israel. So Herod called the visitors from the east to a secret meeting and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem with these instructions. Go and make a careful search for the child, and when you find him, let me know, so that I too may go and worship him. And so they left, and on their way they saw the same star they had seen in the east. When they saw it, how happy they were, What joy was theirs. It went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. They went into the house, and when they saw the child with his mother, Mary, they knelt down and worshipped him. They brought out their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and presented them to him. Then they returned to their country by another road, since God had warned them in a dream not to go back to Herod. They escaped to Egypt. After they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph and said, Herod will be looking for the child in order to kill him. So get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt and stay there until I tell you to leave. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother and left during the night for Egypt where he stayed until Herod died. This was done to make come true what the Lord had said through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. The word of God for the people of God. We continue our worship by singing as with gladness.
Let us bow before the Lord once more as we bring before him our prayers for others. Let us pray. Loving Lord, as the disciples brought others to Jesus that he may lay his hands upon their lives and bless them, we offer our thoughts and our prayers for people we bring to you now. And like the disciples, we bring ourselves as well. We come to you for you are able to do so much more than we can even begin to imagine. So receive our prayers, O Lord, for those who we love, along with those who we may find it hard to love, for those uh, uh, people who are happy and others for people who are in pain, for some for people that we know and others for people that we don't know, but that we see the disaster that surrounds their lives, people that are known by you. And in these quiet moments, Lord, we ask that you would touch lives and make a difference. Jesus, Savior, we pray today for a world so often in turmoil, caught up in war and fear of war, injustice and the neglect of the vulnerable and the neglect of your creation. Teach us how best to use the freedom that we have been given to serve you and to make common cause with all who seek the well-being of others. We pray for people in positions of influence and we remember too the internet and other forms of mass communication May we have the wisdom to nurture what is good and guard against what is harmful. We pray for all who advance knowledge and extend the frontiers of science. And we thank you for the many benefits that we re enjoy as a result of their works. Loving God, may we living in a broken world know your touch of healing and restoration as we thank you for your family across the world and for every act of human kindness. Set us free to worship you with our whole hearts. May we sing and tell of the joy there is in you, God of new beginnings, who hears our prayers and answers the prayers that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing again. Look forward in faith. What, a be what better song to sing at the start of the year?
the beginning of the, new, of the new year tends to be a bit of a nostalgic time. Sometimes we're looking back over the past year, the good and also the bad. Sometimes we look back further into the past. And we also start to make plans for this year and for the future. And we start to try and work out how we want to improve and bring with us the knowledge that we've learned over the previous years into the future as we go forward. And it's at this time of year that you'll get all kinds of things popping up in newspapers or on your phone wanting to give you a wee hand with that. And they'll say things like, we can tell you what your year is going to be like. And we can, if you want, we can help you even further. Here's a helpline, which is very, very kind of them to do that until you realize that there's actually a price to pay if you want them to give you a full reading of what the future holds for the coming year. It's what we call astrology. And folks, I'm saying this only because it kind of gets us in the region a wee bit of what we talk about when we're talking about the three wise men. Hope you'll notice that when we had the reading earlier, it doesn't say there was three. That's something that we project back onto what was originally said. There might have been 33 for all we know. It doesn't say how many. We assume that there was three because there seems to be three gifts. And it would have been rude not to go and take a gift. But maybe the others brought socks and didn't get a mention. We don't know. It doesn't say how many wise men or the real word magi that there were that appeared at the time. Magi, that word magi, comes from the word magician. These would have been kings or rulers' advisors, probably Zoroastrian priests, so the pagan priests from Persia, who studied the stars. But I need to say to you folks, there's a big difference in the study of the stars that's known as astrology, and the study of the stars that's known as astronomy, not to be confused. Astronomy is where human beings look out into the universe and try to gain as much information as we can about stars and planets and how they operate, and where they are, and what their orbit is, and all the rest of it, so that we can work out how, that, how our world fits with all of that, and it becomes an absolute science, and there is so much that we don't know yet. But it's where human beings gain as much knowledge as they can as to the universe in which we live. Astrology is where human beings assume that those lumps of rock that are floating around up there in space have some kind of knowledge of us and can predict what's going to happen in your life or in my life tomorrow or throughout the year. Nah. No buy in it. No buy in it. But that is indeed the kind of thing that these priests would have done and would have studied. There was money to be made. Why? Because if they can read the secret signs of the universe, then that is useful for a local leader who wants to know what's happening in the neighboring nations wants to know that he's not going to be going at war, or if they are, they want to be prepared so that they've got an upper hand. Yes, it's politics all over again, and power play. So when these fellas, who were probably very well paid for their advice, say that this new star has appeared, 
and it means that a new king has been born, that's important to the local ruler. It's important for him to forge alliances at a very early stage because these things are remembered. And we don't have to look very far to understand that. Watch the news. It's appalling what is happening in Gaza right now. Look at the alliances. There are Middle Eastern alliances. There are Eastern Western alliances. There are some that we can call holy and unholy alliances. And sometimes we have to look very, very hard to see God at work in any such alliances. Because we know most of it is power play and politics. And a lot of it is underpinned by finance as well. And none of those are the building blocks that God looks for. Not one. But these chaps, they set off was there a star? What does history say? Well, there was a comet. It was a wee bit earlier, a few years earlier than what we think. That's why also with other things that we look at in Luke's gospel, we reckon the birth of Jesus was nearer 4 to 6 BC. But that kind of matters not. We've got a good kind of picture of events that happen. And these fellas set off with gifts that are more, it's more like the thing that an ambassador would do with gifts to kind of ingratiate themselves with the new king. And they follow the star which leads them into neighboring countries. So um, they're moving now into Israel, and they go to the palace in Jerusalem, which is where they would expect the king to be born. Wrong. There is no baby there. There is a king called Herod, that the Jews didn't like very much. They didn't like him very much because... Do you, anybody watched Harry Potter? Yeah, I've got nods going along. Well, Herod wasn't a pure blood. Okay? He wasn't one of them. He was from out there, not in here. He's no one of us. And they didn't like him very much. In fact, that's maybe an understatement. And what I find fascinating is these priests who have come from Persia go to where they know the palace is. Would they have known much about the Jews? They might have known a wee bitty because 500 years before Jesus was born, at that time Babylon, Babylon had the big empire and they had taken a lot of Jews, a lot of Jews into exile. And they stay in exile for a number of years. It's not until the Persian Empire beats the Babylonians. And you can see all across that pink bitty, the Persian Empire was massive and extensive 500 years before Jesus was born. Persia, Persia by the way, today we know as Iran. But at that time, it covered Iran, Iraq, all the way through what we know today as Israel. It covered the whole lot. And it was the Persian emperor who allowed the people to go back to Jerusalem, allowed them to go free and out of exile. But I need to tell you, a lot of them didn't go. And there was a large, large Jewish settlement within Persia, very large. So I would imagine if these wise men were wise at all, they would have been aware of this big group of people that were part of their country that had strange customs. They didn't eat haggis or have kailis, but they certainly would have had strange customs. But it is doubtful that they would have known all of the Jewish custom and understood it all. And what I find fascinating is that they go to the palace and they get there, and Herod's there. Notice they don't give him the gifts, by the way. 
Okay, but they go looking for this baby. And they say, so where would the baby be born? And Herod doesn't know. What do you mean he doesn't know? He's meant to be the king of the Jews. But he's obviously not a a Bible-believing Jew who's in the temple or the synagogue or anything else like that at the time because he would have heard these scriptures being read over and over and over again and the words of the prophets. He's got to ask his own wise men to go and look it up before he can tell these travelers where to find this newborn baby. And off they set on their way again. Notice he wants to keep a, a, a kind of a, 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 a contact with them. Come back this way. I'll put the kettle on. And you can let me know where you found the child. But this is all self-serving as far as Herod is concerned. And they head off again. And there's a couple of things that also we need to note and that are really quite interesting about this passage. Because sorcery and the kind of astrology was actually forbidden under Jewish law. It was a no-no. In fact, the Jewish priests would have looked down on anybody that got involved in that kind of stuff, chicken bones or whatever. That don't need any of that. And yet, we don't get any kind of hint in Matthew's gospel that these people who have journeyed with their gifts were looked down upon. In fact, they are treated with utmost respect all the way through. And the other thing that is really fascinating is the way that God has used what they know, which is the study of the stars to communicate an important message to people who were not Jews, but that were also being called to worship, that were also being called to belong to God. Now, there would have been zero chance of these people being in the Jewish temple or in any kind of synagogue to hear this message. But it was an important message that God needed them to hear. God allows these pagan people to be part of his story and his plan in our world. And he calls them to be part of it and he goes them to great, to great lengths to get them to where they need to be. They see it in the stars. And we must be aware as we move on into 2024 that God will communicate with us sometimes in the strangest of ways. That he has plans for us. He has plans for us as individuals. He has plans for us as his people, the church. He has plans for what is going to be happening in Forfar, and he has plans for what will be happening worldwide. And he will communicate with us in whatever way he feels we will pick up best. And it might be through someone else. But he will make sure that we know all that we need to know, and he will open the doors that we need to have open. Now, I said earlier that it is very, very um, easy to overinterpret a passage of Scripture. But I don't think that what I'm about to say next is an overinterpretation, and I'll tell you why. So, the passage that we read earlier mentions the word worship twice. Once, when the wise men arrive at the palace, and there's Herod. And they say, where's the child that's born to be king? We've come to worship him. And then we hear it again when they find the child. But I need to tell you that word that we have as worship, in the original Greek, 
More means to pay homage to. More of a diplomatic exercise. We've come bearing gifts from a neighboring nation to pay homage to you and your new king. Let's be friends, kind of thing. We could do with a few more of that in the world right now, to be honest. And that's what the word there means. It's not a kind of they've come because they think that this baby is a god and they want to come and worship in that sense. It's more diplomacy, to pay homage to. But folks, I think that it's a different meaning to that word by the time they find the child, and I'll tell you why. They must have realized that something strange was going on when they don't find the child at the palace. Born to be king, for goodness sakes. They've been led there. Then it talks about how overjoyed they are when they see the star again and they start following this star to right over where they need to be. God has got them to the right place. Now here's the thing. You've got these wealthy diplomats with, you know, the kind of gift that you normally would have a chain and a handcuff around your wrist on a briefcase and a special key hidden away somewhere with these very expensive gifts. They're not going to a stable, by the way. You'll notice it said to the house. And it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. If Joseph is going back to the town where he was born, he probably still has family there. I would imagine his wife's just had this child. They stay where they are until the child's a bit older. He's a tradesman. He would get work. So whether they're in the house of the extended family or their own place, we don't know. But they're definitely now no longer in a stable. That was just for emergencies. But these important visitors are now going to the household of a peasant family. They're not royalty. And by now they've twigged something strange is going on and something different is happening. And they offer their gifts. But I don't think it's an over-interpretation that when that word homage, that Greek word appears again, that it's a different kind of worship that we see now as they kneel down and worship child. It's also interesting, they get digs somewhere for the night. It doesn't say where. I wouldn't have thought they would have stayed in the stable. But they get digs somewhere for the night. And while they are sleeping, God communicates with them again, but in a different way this time. It's no longer through astrology, bits of rock floating around in space. It's now direct and communicates to them one-to-one. The child will be in danger if you go back to Herod. Go home a different way. And it's interesting because Joseph is getting a similar message as well. To keep this child safe. Get up and get out of there. God, you see, communicates with us not for some kind of diplomatic event. He doesn't want to be keeping us at arm's length. He wants to be holding us close to ensuring that no harm comes to us just in the same way as he did then. He wants us to be part of his plan. It doesn't matter what our background is. It didn't matter that they'd been sorcerers God was now speaking to them direct as part of his plan. And he does exactly the same with us for each and every one, for we're all precious in his sight. And he was calling them to come and worship and no longer to follow a star, but to follow this new king, Jesus. And in exactly the same way, 
He follows us to come, not to stay at a distance, but to draw close to him and to follow the light of the world, Jesus. No longer a baby in a manger. The one who came to make a difference, an impact on our lives. And it's important at the start of a new year that we not only hear that call, but that we step up to the mark. Let us pray. Loving Lord, we thank you for your word because it's a word that carries important meaning for each and every one of us. We thank you that these words from thousands of years ago, from events that happened in a different time and society and place, can still jump out of the page and speak right into our lives. And we pray, Lord, that of all the things we do this year, that we hold on to you with every breath that we take that we follow your path, that we follow your leading. May we be aware of your guidance this year. Maybe we be aware of when we're being taken along the wrong trail. Maybe we, may we be aware when we turn up at the wrong place and be guided to the right one whatever that means in our lives. And may we know your hand upon us now and evermore, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're just going to take a moment as we take up our offering. Let us pray. Loving Lord, at the start of a new year, we thank you for the blessings of the past. We thank you for your goodness and for your lavishness with your love that you pour out upon us. Lord, we bring our gifts to you today and we ask that you would accept them and bless them. We ask for your guidance that we would use them wisely that these are gifts that you have given us to help to build your kingdom. And we ask that you would lead us every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not going to go through all of the intimations again, but just to say please come and have a cuppy in the hall after and we can catch up with all of your news and any of your plans for the new year. And we're going to close just now by singing, well, it has to be... We three kings of Orient are. I remember this has been quite a long one, so you might want to lean on the pew to, to get through it. Let's stand and sing together.
So may the light of the gospel, the good news of Christ, shine in your hearts, transform your lives, and brighten the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us now and evermore. Amen.